Welcome to the Real Estate Podcast with Robert Eichert. It is Sunday, June 5, 2022, and this is episode number five. And so I wanted to start off with some real estate articles. Um, But before I get to that, I wanted to read to you a, a LinkedIn post that I found interesting from a plant manager at Sulphur Operation Support, Bruce Anderson. This is his post. He says, I need to get something or copy of, it says copy of Austin Smith post. Um, I need to get something off my chest. I generally refrain from talking politics. That's especially making political posts. However, I need to say this. What I'm going to post is real, not somebody that's a friend's cousin's sister's neighbor has happening to them i own a small trucking company he says and this is what the fuel crisis is doing to our country so this directly affects me you our children our country today i filled up my truck to deliver products that help keep our country fed when i filled up my truck it cost me one thousand one hundred forty nine dollars and fifty cents This is one truck for one day of fuel. I own three. So for one day of operation, it's operation. It's costing me $3,448.50 in gas. Yes, we use a full tank of fuel every single day, sometimes more than one tank per day. My trucks generally run five to six days a week. So we'll just estimate on the low side and say five. That's $17,242 last week. Last week was over $20,000 for one week that I have to pay out of my pocket to try to keep not only my children fed, but those of my employees and our company, he says. Mark my words, we are on a downhill slide to the worst recession our country has ever seen. If you don't believe me, I implore you to do your research. He says, trucking companies are going under left and right, literally hundreds weekly. If you're not aware what you're wearing, what you're eating, what you're living in, what you're driving, what you're reading this on was delivered by a truck. If something drastic doesn't change in the next few weeks, months, I promise you, you'll see empty shelves everywhere you look. You'll see chaos as people fight for the basic necessities of everyday life, food, medicine, etc. He goes on to say, if something doesn't change. I pray that all of you have the ability, knowledge, and skills to fend for yourself, not only against those who would do your your family harm, but to be able to find sustainable food and water. This is a scary time, not only for small business owners, but every single American, he says. So please, please do your research when we vote for those we place in power. This is not just on the federal level, but on the state levels as, as well. We've got to start making informed decisions based on that fact. Not because the media says we should like or dislike somebody. He says, truck truck drivers are out here going for broke, holding on to something we know this country needs. So if you know a truck driver, please tell them to hold on as long as they can. Our country won't survive without them. And it shows a picture of diesel gas taken on June 2nd. 2022 in Idaho Falls and it's six dollars and five cents a gallon so that's one trucker's post to LinkedIn um, and uh, it sounds like it's really difficult out there with these high gas prices to be in the trucking industry now why would I bring that up on a real estate podcast well because as you all are aware real estate is not in an island of its on its own we are very susceptible to the, the economy at large and what goes on in the economy at large and um, gas prices are fundamental to what's driving the economy or, or what powers the economy what powers everything we do in the economy and and it affects real estate because it if I mean, it, we could go on and on. It affects people and people live in real estate and do business out of real estate. If retail stores are experiencing high inflation, they're going to close. If restaurants can't make it because of high food prices or uh, inability to attract 
work workers at a reasonable rate, they can't stay open. Um, if workers have to commute too far and they start looking at how much it costs in gas to go to a job and they start running the numbers on that, they may realize they can only work close to home. So it just can have a lot of effects on real estate. Um, people may start living more families to one house um, or apartment, more than one family that can reduce demand on real estate. Um, it's hard right now to get many supplies, many, everything costs a lot of money. Also all due to fuel prices, not all due to it, but it's a huge component of the price of many building materials mm -hmm. and other things, appliances and other things that are needed for real estate. And so, yes, it's very relevant what's going on with that trucker and his gas prices and the suffering they're going through. So just thought I would read that to start off. But on a more positive note, I have an article here from Forbes dated June 2nd, 2022 by Am Patrick Carroll. And it's about the foreign investment in the United States surges amid global market volatility. So the article says the global pandemic and other international situations have caused uncertainty in capital markets. When uncertainty picks up, interest rates go down. Now, multiple global crises converge to deliver a much different scenario, and the Feds are raising interest rates regardless. While rising interest rates might spook U.S. buyers, we are seeing an influx of foreign investors from other countries. Article goes on to say, we are in a unique situation. In the past, if there had been a threat of recession and the Fed wasn't having an, to offset inflation, interest rates would be lower. When there is a fear in the market, the cost of interest rates, interest typically goes down and the Fed wants people to go out and borrow and buy products. During those times, people hoard their cash, so it's an incentive for businesses and people to go out and buy. Now the market and the oil supply have been affected which will drive up the cost of oil and deplete disposable income. This has a domino effect on the economy, which affects the real estate business. The economy will suffer if the feds raise interest rates too high and too fast. There are likely trillions of dollars in adjustable rate debt. So if you have an adjustable rate mortgage, for example, on your house, this is probably not a good time to be involved with that. Because as interest rates go up, your your payments are going to go up. They're not they're not fixed. So, but there can be adjustable rate debt in commercial as well, commercial real estate. So, this article goes on to talk about the COVID crisis, and it says here later on in the article. According to a Deloitte report, as limitations on international travel lifted, foreign investment in U.S. commercial real estate rebounded in the second half of 2021. Foreign investment saw a $53 billion bump in the second half, accounting for an overwhelming majority of the $69 billion annual total from 2021, the second strongest H2 since data began in 2001. So... Out of $69 billion annual commercial real estate investment last year, $53 billion in the United States, $53 billion of that was from foreign investment. So that's, that's pretty significant. It says, in the residential space, foreign investors continue to look to U.S. real estate as a safe haven investment, and I believe that the current crisis will bring more foreign investors to the U.S. So there's always been an attraction to United States real estate for people living abroad. For example, well, one reason is that I would say is we have um, the Constitution, we have constitutional um, rights, private property rights. We have good laws, stable laws in this country um, that protect private property rights. 
and other countries may be more like a banana republic type of situation where you may own property today and tomorrow the next dictator who comes into power declares that he owns your property and um so that's not a good feeling for people when they work hard for their money to invest in a country that that is subject to those type of things but more so than that we also have um strong financial system even though we are going through some challenges right now we have a good financial system where people have confidence in the United States and also with the stock market I mean I don't follow the stock market on a regular basis but I know enough to know it's not been good um, so money likes to go somewhere and and under your bed or in a bank account is not really a great way to put your money in many cases and some sometimes that might be good if everything's crashing down around you but over the long haul it's it's been shown that it's better to invest your money than to um, leave it in the bank or something like that. It says foreign, the article goes on to say it's a hedge against inflation. Foreign investors will continue to look at the United States despite rising interest rates. Income producing properties, income producing real estate, anything that you can rent and earn a cash yield is a free cash flow yield on invested equity. With properties that are cash flowing, think about apartments, industrial hotels, anything you can buy and rent out. The cash flows after your debt service, especially the properties that allow rent adjustments. So your interest costs go up as expenses for your employees go up, supplies go up, and you can at least keep some pace by that by raising your rents. So income of producing properties that allow rent adjustments, such as hotels and apartments, break inflationary heads with the idea that you can pass along expenses incurred. You can offset increases in expenses with higher rents, hence an inflationary hedge. These opportunities will continue to attract foreign and domestic investors. So that's an interesting article um, and surprising to know how much foreign investment is occurring in the United States. It's shocking how much of the investment last year was from abroad. So, um, moving on, I have an article here by ben, Jim Buchta of the, and it's an article about, um, with the Star Tribune. It says, apartment construct construction tripled in the Twin Cities during May. Apartment construction more than tripled in the Twin Cities last month as rising mortgage rates slowed demand for single-family houses. During May, builders pulled enough permits to develop 1,529 apartments and other multifamily units, a 450 percent increase compared with last year, according to data compiled by the Keystone Report and Housing First Minnesota. For single-family houses, builders pulled 559 permits, 18% fewer than last year. The article goes on to say, though multifamily permits can vary dramatically month to month, rental construction has outpaced the single-family sector since the beginning of the year. That's an indication, some home builders say, that rising mortgage rates and home prices are putting a lid on demand for single-family homes. So this is in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And the um, article goes on to say, home, home builders are feeling the impacts of rising interest rates as home buyers deal with the reality of what they can afford with new rates, says James Jolkowski, president of Housing First Minnesota. Article says demand for rental housing in the Twin Cities softened a bit towards the beginning of the pandemic as people avoided shared living spaces and young people moved home with their parents. That was especially true in urban areas that were popular with people who wanted to live near their office and close to shops, restaurants, and other urban attractions. Then it goes on to say demand for rental housing is now on the rise again and the the average apartment vacancy rate in the Twin Cities metro during the first quarter tightened, 
tightened, even in downtown Minneapolis, where the vacancy rate was the highest. Across the metro area, average vacancy rate in the first quarter was 3.6%, according to Marquette Advisors. So that's pretty, pretty good in, um, vacancy rate for any real estate product. That's almost what you would call a perfect equilibrium. You, you really almost can never achieve much better than a 3% vacancy rate because people are always moving in and moving out um, of residential properties or commercial properties. So to have a vacancy rate of 3.6% is very strong. So the article goes on to say, based on the number of multifamily permits per capita, the busiest metro areas for apartment construction during the first quarter were in Sunbelt states and a few northern metros, including the Twin Cities. That list was led by Austin, Texas, which issued 26.1 permits per 10,000 people during the first quarter, followed by Jacksonville and then Salt Lake City. The Twin Cities was number nine on the list with 11.1 permits per 10,000 people. In a national comparison of rents, Redfin cited the Twin Cities as one of only three metros where rents fell during April. Compared with a national rent increase of 15%, the Twin Cities saw rents decline 2% over last year. Redfin's Deputy Chief Economist Taylor Marr attributed the increase in apartment construction and declines in rent to changes in local zoning policies, including the abolition of single family zoning in Minneapolis in 2018. So Minneapolis abolished single family zoning in 2018. I wasn't aware of that. Finally, the article says low interest rates have long shielded home buyers from the rising affordability issue in our state as it has become increasingly more expensive to build new homes with the steep regulatory costs in our region, the supply chain challenges, and the labor shortage. So they're, they're really building a lot of apartments up there as a result of some of the economics going on. I have a couple articles from NASDAQ, and they do not have a specific R author cited but they come from NASDAQ. It says, this first one says, construction spending soars. The U.S. Mm -hmm. Census Bureau said on June 1 that construction spending rose 0.2% in April at a seasonably, seasonally adjusted annual rate of $1,744,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000
which has been helping the sector. So that's that. Here's another NASDAQ article with, and I cannot find a specific author, but it says nearly 7 million homes are sold each year in the United States and their cumulative value makes residential real estate a multi-trillion dollar market. However, the actual process of buying and selling homes is virtually unchanged from a decade ago. Real estate technology company Redfin Corporation is trying to change that. The company is pursuing an end-to-end -end service that makes moving a delight instead of something that makes you want to pull your hair out. So it goes on to say, in recent years, Redfin has built out its business model, setting up to handle mortgages, title, and escrow, and even offering iBuying, where Redfin will purchase your home outright and resell it. So it says, question, can Redfin's model be profitable? Redfin has been in business for years, but it still isn't a profitable company. Both bottom line profits, net income, and free cash flow are in the red, which means that Redfin is burning cash. The company's latest quarter, first quarter of 2022, showed that Redfin's revenue from its brokerage services was $168 million, but that the cost of revenue was $154 million. That's only a gross part profit margin of 13%, which isn't enough to offset investments into the company like technology and marketing. Redfin's operating losses were $85 million in the first quarter of 2022, or Q1 2022. Redfin's business is much more than the brokerage segment. Still, it might be fair to wonder how profitable brokerage can be with human agents who require competitive salaries and benefits and can only handle so many transactions. More agents will be needed as Redfin does more volume of transactions. So that last statement, sentence, points to the fact that Redfin agents typically do not make as much per transaction as a regular real estate agent. Um, additionally, iBuying has forced its way into the conversation. Zillow tried to dive into the iBuying segment but failed. While Redfin seems to be taking a slower approach, it uses, it uses a balanced combination of human input and technology to prepare its offers and charges a fee ranging from 5 to 13%. Redfin is still an iBuying mm -hmm. underdog compared to market leader Opendoor, which has $11.3 billion in liquidity for iBuying, compared to $400 million for Redfin. But Redfin's end-to-end -end vision isn't centered around the iBuying model. Investors should think of iBuying as the cherry on Redfin's cake and not the cake itself. So, wrapping up, Redfin has a market cap of just $1 billion after the stocks tumble from highs of almost 100 to 10 during the bear market. The massive real estate market is a huge opportunity and long-term success could make Redfin a tremendous investment. That comes from the article. That's not me saying that. So that's Redfin. That's another um, big, what I call them, is a search engine for real estate like Zillow. I think that's their main business and that's Zillow's main business where you can search property values, search real estate, search um statistics and facts about a particular piece of property and they really have some good data on those websites that you can look at and you can almost do your own market analysis by by going to those websites uh, for a comparative market analysis you can find properties they will give you they, you can find properties near a property you're looking at or that you currently live in so they will give you a, for example, Zillow gives a Zestimate, and that's an estimate of what your property is worth. Now, that's not necessarily the best or the worst estimate. It's just another estimate. And in, in, a, in a real estate appraisal, um, is if somebody does a real estate appraisal, a professional appraiser on a piece of property, many people have to realize 
need to realize that that's just an opinion. Um, it's usually a well-researched opinion based on comps, or co what, what is called comparable properties in the area. And it's, um, and Zillow and Redfin do it based off computers, and computers figure it out based on where you live. So um, they do give an estimate, and you might want to double check those estimates just to make sure if you are going to look at one of those um, that there isn't something wrong with it. Um, but that's like with any estimate, you always want to realize that any appraisal or estimate on a property's value is just that. It's an opinion. It's somebody's opinion. And um, it could be right. It could be wrong. It could be. But really, I mean, the ultimate, they, they teach us in the law, the ultimate way to determine the value of a property is what a willing purchaser and a willing buyer will pay for a property. So you may have some huge estimate or appraisal out there, but if you can't find somebody to buy your property for that price, is it really worth that? And so really what it comes down to is what a willing buyer and a willing seller or agree, agree to pay for a piece of property. That's the ultimate determination of a property's value. So um, you need to keep that in mind when looking at property values. And a little bit more about Redfin and Zillow. I really like those sites and Open Door and um, some of the others. I really like them. I enjoy looking at them. They really do bring a lot of, shed a lot of light on the industry or on the, not, not so much the industry, but they shed light on a lot of transactions that were previously much more difficult to obtain. You used to have to go and ask a realtor to maybe do perform a um, comparative market analysis. And what they would do is they would go to the MLS and they'd dig up the records, either on the computer, and they would dig up the records and try to find the comps, and then they'd put together a price, and then they'd get back with you. Well, now all you have to do is type in an address, and you can get a pretty good estimate of what your property is worth. And that's really um, valuable um, to be able to get a quick answer. Now, you might want a better answer. You might want to have somebody make sure somebody's doing um, another type of analysis or you might want to pay for an appraisal. Your bank will, if you're getting a bank loan, they'll insist on a, an appraisal by a licensed appraiser and, and that yes, that is a licensed profession. Licensed and regulated profession is being a real estate appraiser. And um, we also have real estate appraisers in the commercial world. And just a little bit about that, I guess this will be the educational component of this podcast, they they look at, like, for example, on a piece of commercial property, they will look at, well, they'll look at the cash flow value, okay? So from a cash flow perspective, they'll look at how much it would cost to rebuild um, a property. So they'll look at things like that. Um, they may look at... Um, so they'll look at it on a, on a cash flow perspective. They'll, so they'll take a, a piece of property and they'll say, well, what are the rents that are coming in? They'll look at the rents. They'll look at your, your expenses for the property. And then they, they can put, they have a formulas that they attach to those after they dig up that information and they run it through a formula. And then they can come up with a cash value, uh, number for your so that's called the income approach and then you can also have the the construction costs approach or the just to, to rebuild that piece of property so you take a piece of commercial property and you don't look at the income you just look at okay here i have this standalone restaurant for example you may say what what would it cost to build that well where where are you building it are you building it on a busy street or is it not on a busy street out in the country. Um, so that that matters. If it's on a busy highway or a busy street, well, you have to factor in the cost of the land, which may be quite a bit. Then on top of that, you got to factor in the um, cost of building 
a restaurant. And that's not just the construction costs. That's also time. Time is a, is a factor. Um, if it's going to take you four years in a certain market to build a, a restaurant, that's expensive because people's time is expensive. If, it can, if you can get one up in three months, that's another story. Um, uh, you have to look at all kinds of things that go into the, the permitting process. How difficult is it? Is it a very difficult place to get permits to build a, a, a restaurant, for example, if that's what you're looking at as a restaurant? So you look at the, you look at the, you have to look at the price of the land and the price of building it from scratch. Then you can also look at comparables. You, you can look at comparable properties. So those are different ways that they value commercial real estate. Um, but residential is usually just, um, they'll look at comparable. They'll look at what other houses or um, whatever it is, a duplex or a townhome, and they'll look at comparable real estate in the area. And they usually try to keep it within a certain geographic, you know, not like too far away. Um, unless you're out in the country, then you may have to go farther away to get a good comparable. But so that's just a little bit about um, appraising and appraisals and how they how they do them and and residential versus commercial appraisals. A little bit about international loot news today. Um, Thailand approves tax break for real estate trusts. This comes out of the uh, CNA publication. Reuters is the source. And it says that real estate investment trusts or REITs buybacks will be exempt from tax and are expected to regenerate or to generate reinvestment of about 30 billion bots or 800 68.06 million in the industry, said a government spokesman, spokeswoman from Thailand. So they're going to ex exempt them from tax. So it says the government will lose about 10.4 billion in tax revenue and fees, she said. Well, I always find it interesting when they say statements like that. When there's a tax break given, they talk about how much the government will lose. Well, that that's a very that's a that's a very narrow point of view to look at it that way. They wouldn't be giving a tax break to, to and so they can lose money. Yes, it may be a a loss of tax revenue and fees, but they're probably going to make it up in other tax revenue and fees. What, for example, when they're given a tax break, realtors or I'm I'm sorry. Developers are given a tax break to move, to do real estate development in a particular area in the United States. Um, oftentimes, what will happen is they they also know that they're going to make it up on other in other ways. Like for example, if you give Walmart, this has been one of the big ones over the years. Walmart will be given a certain tax incentives to build in a community. Well, why is that community? Because do they really want to have um, um, tax revenue and fee losses? No, they're doing it because they know they're going to make income tax off of the sales sales taxes. So they're going to make, um, I'm sorry, I meant to say sales taxes. They're going to generate a lot of sales tax revenue from those, um, from that Walmart in that community over the years. And so that's the theory that they'll make more sales tax revenue than what they're giving a break in, in taxes. And then also they provide jobs for the community and they provide more um, shopping opportunities for people in the community. So there's a lot more that goes into that calculation than just simply saying the government will lose tax revenue and fees. But anyway, the, the article goes on to say the property sector, which contributed about 6% of GDP in 2019, slowed due to the pandemic and began recovering this year. This is for Thailand. So far, eight REITs have expressed interest in the new tax breaks, including trusts in hotels and amusement parks. So 
money will go where the taxes are friendly. That's not only um, within the United States, but internationally. Money flows towards um, places that have um, tax favorable environments. And um, many of these um, countries and other places can benefit greatly by um, having lo lower taxes, or in this case in Thailand, no taxes for real estate investment trusts to build there. So they will benefit by a lot of foreign capital coming in and building things um, in their country, whereas maybe a neighboring country who doesn't have those incentives won't, won't get that investment. So that's the, that's the whole idea behind that, and it looks like they're getting some interest. And really, a real estate investment trust, if they figure they can make, put up, let's say you're going to put up apartments. Well, if you're going to put them in country A versus country B, and it's going to cost you roughly the same to put them in, but country B is giving you a no-tax environment to build there, well, you're going to probably build in country B because you're trying to increase the returns for your investors in your real estate investment trust. So all other things being equal, a tax break like that can make a big difference in where a um, company or companies or REITs in that, that example, real estate investment trusts, invest their money. So, so the WSWS.org um, says by Allison Smith, rents in Britain unaffordable for majority of workers. So UK rents are rising at their fastest rate in 14 years. According to property website Zoopla, they rose 11% nationwide over the past year to an average of nearly £1,000 per month, forcing the average tenant to spend more than one-third of their household, in household income on rent. In London, single workers are forced to spend a staggering 52% of their income, with payments increasing by 15.7% in the capital city. Zoopla reports demand for rental properties was up 76% this year compared to the past four years, citing students and young workers returning to work as the government ends all COVID restrictions. Yeah, so article goes on to say, in 2016, London's banking, I'm sorry, London's barking in Degaham, Dagaham Borough had 50 times more people on the waiting list than available properties, causing a 50-year waiting list for council housing. Since 1980, the borough has lost 50% of its council housing stock, mainly to, due to the right to buy introduced under the Thatcher government, under which tenants could buy their council property at a reduced rate. So under the article goes on to say that... Uh, former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher instituted this policy that more than 40% of council houses sold to their tenants under the right to buy terms are now privately rented out to local authorities um, paying millions to private landlords to house homeless fa families and properties they once owned. The spiraling cost of living has pushed thousands into debt leading to a 63% rise in no-fault renter evictions with more than 3,700 evictions between January and March this year, up 38% over the previous quarter. Margaret Perry, a renter who earns £30,000 per year, told The Guardian that her landlord put up her rent by 22% to £825 per month and her room in Harrogate. She says that's just not an option. It's hard enough as it is. So, article goes on to say, house prices have increased by 55,000 pounds, with the purchase cost of the average home now roughly 368,000 pounds. And this price, it is, at this price, it is nearly impossible for workers to get on the home ownership ladder. Most are unable to save for the down payment and fees required to buy a home because nearly all of their monthly income is spent on food, fuel, and rent. And that's the same, one of the same issues we're facing here in the United States. 
is rising fuel costs are causing rising food costs, which are causing rising everything costs. And also as rents are going up because housing price, well, first of all, there's a shortage of housing in the United States. That's increasing rents. And so we have a shortage of housing. And then another thing is it's expensive to build new housing. And so mm -hmm. this is all raising the, the cost of existing uh, rental properties. It ra it's raising their rent. And so many people are unable to save for the down payment and fees required here as well. So anyway, the article goes on to say the Center for Economics and Business Research expects that disposable incomes will fall in 2022 by 4.8% with a further fall of 1.4% in 2023. The, the forecast fall in living standards this year is an estimated 71 billion pounds, which amounts to 2,533 pounds per household, the largest since records started in 1955. So disposable incomes are falling. Um, that doesn't mean your income is necessarily falling. That means your disposable income. Those are two different things. Disposable income is what you have left after paying for necessities, such as housing, food, um, other things like that fuel, transportation. So what's left is considered your disposable income and it's it's falling as the cost of everything else goes up or the cost of necessities goes up, you have less and less disposable income. And that's gonna first hit the entertainment industries, entertainment, food service, food, food services like restaurants, um, things like that. Those are going to be the first and hardest hit if this continues. And just unfortunately, like they were hardest hit during the pandemic that which we're barely coming out of. So um, it's going to be a double whammy for many in those industries um, for the ones that survived the pandemic. So that's it for today. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to having you back again. Thank you.